and welcome back to my vlog, Tea Leaves by Francis S. Drake, Part 11. Hancock and Henry Knox were members of this volunteer guard. Volunteers were, after the first night, requested to leave their names at the printing office of Eddies and Gill, the duty of providing it having devolved upon the Committee of Correspondence. Obadiah Curtis, born in Roxbury, Mass. in 1724, died in Newton, Mass., November 11, 1811. He was a wheelwright by trade, and his wife, Martha, kept an English goods store at the corner of Rawson's Lane, now Bromfield Street, and Newbury, now Washington Street, and accumulated a handsome estate. Becoming obnoxious to the British authorities, Mr. Curtis removed with his family to Providence, remaining there until after the evacuation of Boston. A person who saw him at this time thus describes his appearance. He was habited according to the fashion of gentlemen of those days, in a three-cornered hat, a club wig, a long coat of ample dimensions that appeared to have been made with reference to future growth, breeches with large buckles, and shoes fastened in the same manner. James Henderson was a painter in Boston at the beginning of this century. Daniel Hughes, a mason by trade, resided on Purchase Street, where he died July 9, 1821, aged 77. He was a brother of George Robert Twelves Hughes. Robert Hitchborn was a cooper on Ann Street in 1789. Thomas Knox, Jr., a branch pilot, died in Charlestown, Mass. in April 1817, aged 75. He joined the Masonic Lodge of St. Andrew in 1764. In 1789, his residence was on Friend Street. Joseph Lovering was a tallow chandler. He lived on the corner of Hollis and Tremont Streets, opposite Crane and the Bradleys. Joseph Lovering, Jr., held the light by which Crane and others disguised themselves in Crane's carpenter shop on the evening of December 16th. Lovering was a prominent member of the Charitable Mechanic Association, was many years a selectman and a fire ward under the old town government of Boston, and was also a member of the first board of aldermen under Mayor Phillips. He followed his father's business and was some years a partner in the firm of J. Lovering and Sons. Joshua Pico, a cooper on Sheaf Street, residing on Clark Street, died in January 1807. Joseph Pierce, Jr. was a merchant at 58 Cornhill in 1799. Nicholas Pierce was a bricklayer on Back, Salem Street, in 1800. John Rice was deputy collector at Boston, 1789. Benjamin Stevens was a tailor at 33 Marlboro Street in 1789. Jonathan Stoddard was a member of St. Andrew's Lodge of Freemasons in 1779. Thomas Tileston, born September 21, 1735, was a carpenter on Purchase Street in 1789. His father, Onesiphorus Tileston, Tileston, also a housewright and a man of wealth, was captain of the artillery company in 1762. John Winthrop resided in Cambridge Street and died February 12, 1800, aged 53. The power and influence of the Boston Committee of Correspondence, which played so important a part in the tea affair, can best be estimated by a glance at the list of names of its members. They were Samuel Adams, James Otis, Joseph Warren, William Molyneux, Dr. Benjamin Church, William Denny, William and Joseph Greenleaf, Dr. Thomas Young, William Powell, Nathaniel Appleton, Oliver Wendell, Josiah Quincy, Jr., John Sweetser, Richard Boynton, John Bradford, William Mackey, Nathaniel Barber, Caleb Davis, Alexander Hill, and Robert Pierpont. After the dissolution of the meeting of November 29, the committee met and called on the committees from other towns to join them on all necessary occasions. Besides sending accounts of these events to all the towns, they also wrote to the committees of Rhode Island, New Hampshire, New York, and Philadelphia, explaining their course, acting, as they said, in the faith that harmony and occur concurrence in action uniformly and firmly maintained must finally conduct them to the end of their wishes, namely, a full enjoyment of constitutional liberty. They received cheering replies and encouraging assurances from all quarters. At the meeting next morning, a letter to John Scully from the consignees containing their long-delayed proposals was read. 
They expressed sorrow that they could not return satisfactory answers to the two messages of the town, as it was utterly out of their power to send the teas back, but said they were willing to store them until they could communicate with their constituents and receive further orders respecting them. This letter irritated the meeting, and it declined to, to take action upon it. Before taking final leave of these obstinate gentlemen, I make a few citations from the recently published volume of The Diary and Letters of Thomas Hutchinson. Writing to his son at the castle on November 30, H Hutchison says, The gentlemen, consignees, except your Uncle Clark, all went to the castle yesterday. I hope they will not comply with such a monstrous demand. Hancock and Adams, he says, were two of the guard of the tea ship. Thomas Hutchinson, Jr., to his brother Elisha. Castle William, December 14, 1773. I imagine you are anxious to know what the poor banished commissioners are doing at the castle. Our retreat here was sudden, but our enemies do not say we came too soon. How long we shall be imprisoned, tis impossible to say. I hear there is a meeting of the mobility today, but don't know the result. I hardly think they will attempt sending the tea back, but am more sure it will not go many leagues. The commissioners are, well, are all with us, and we are as comfortable as we can be in a very cold place, driven from our families and business, with the months of January and February just at hand. P.S. Our situation is rendered more agreeable by the polite reception we met with from Colonel Leslie and the other gentlemen of the Army. And on January 9, 1774, he writes, The Bostonians say we shall not return to town without making concessions. I suppose we shall quit the castle sometime this week, but as we are all provided with retreats in the country, I have had a disagreeable six weeks of it, but I'm in hopes the issue will be well. And again, on January 21st, dated Milton, I wrote you some time ago I was in hopes our harassment was drawing to a close and that we should leave the castle last week. Mr. Fanuel and myself coming off caused a supposition that we intended for Boston, which was the cause of Saturday's notification, which I sent you. Mr. Fanuel is since returned to the castle, and I am really more confined than if I was there, as I keep pretty close to my home. Mr. Jonathan Clark sails in a few days for England, of which I am very glad, as it may prevent misapprehension of our conduct on that side of the water. So again, starting to get exciting. We're coming up on December 16th. But that's all for today. More tomorrow. Make it a great day, and bye for now.